Thanks everyone for attending this uh, session about uh, the FPNA in startup. How do we try to predict the future? Um, first, let me introduce myself. So I'm Lies. I'm working at Spendesk. I'm leading the FPNA team. Uh, Spendesk to provide a spending management solution. Uh, we are more than 300 employees as of today, and we just uh, fundraised the 100 euro, million euro in Series C this, uh, this summer. We have the chance to have three wonderful speakers with us today. I will let you introduce them, themselves. Uh, we have Luis, uh, Director of Finance at Swogo. Up to you, Luis. Okay. Hi, everybody, and, and welcome. Thank you, first of all, for for Lies to have, having inviting me. Uh, my name is Luis. Uh, I'm from Portugal. I've been uh, Sogos Finance Director for the past two and a half years. Uh, it's not my first experience in a startup. Uh, I already helped another startup to become a scale-up. Uh, and then uh, I was coached by, by Sogo to help, help us do the same. So this is my role now. At Swogo, we offer an automated uh, bundle solution for on online retailers so they can improve their basket value, their margin, and also, also help the customer to have a better consuming experience. Cool. Thank you, Luis. Um, I also, we have, also have Rain, Head of Finance and Accounting uh, at Trubil. Up to you, Rain. Thank you and welcome you all. I'm Bren, I'm head of accounting and finance over here at Truebill and amongst many things, I help to run our FP&A side of the shop. Um, Truebill is a personal finance app, so we do direct to consumers and help people to get a good understanding of their financial picture and better their financial health. And excited to talk to y'all. Thank you, Ray. Um, we are also welcoming Javier, a newly director of finance at Ukyo. Ukyo. Okay, thank you, thank you, Liz, and well, welcome everybody. Thanks for thanks for assisting here. Um, well, Javier, I'm just recently uh, take take over the finance direction of uh, Ukyo, which is a prop tech company, which is less it has less than a year. Which right now we are revolutionary, revolutioning the mean term uh, rental apartment industry. We find a gap there and uh, actually we're skyrocketing now. I've been, I've been working in startups for the past five to six years in the finance department, always uh, helping to build the, this, the, the department. I'll help them in order to uh, construct like solid structure in order to, to grow. So I'm a believing guy who just started living in, in Barcelona who started in the in the startup world and i'm really passionate about being growing in this in, in in this industry and in technology most of it so uh basically it's that thanks a lot for the cool. cool thank you javier um a quick overview of the main topic of this session so we are going to um, discuss about few items at the very end we are going to uh, have a q a session so don't, don't hesitate to use uh, the Q and A tab to ask all your questions during the during the this session, and we are going to tackle a uh, maximum of uh, questions at the very end. Um, let's start uh, by the first main topic: uh, the why. Uh, why did you start implementing a, a FPNS stack in your uh, in your company, and and what was your main uh, your main challenges, your main goal when you you, uh, you started to implement in them. Uh, I know that in the last few months we had uh, to reforecast almost every month our figures based on the new lockdown, the end of lockdown, etc. Uh, in your in, in your side, what was your uh, your your main objective to uh, to implement this uh, this stack uh, SPNA at a, at the startup? Maybe Rain, uh, if you can start. Yeah, sure thing. Um, yeah, so, you know, mostly what we were trying to do at Truebill and, and generally when I helped to set up FP&A stacks, 
you know, a, a lot of it about is about understanding the future of the company, really getting a clear vision for where you can best put resources. And FP&A is kind of at the, uh, the critical moment or the critical point for that. So really helping to align the organization around what are the metrics that matter? How do we best predict those metric, metrics? And then helping the organization understand, are we on track or are, 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 we, are we off track um, as it relates to those metrics and making the appropriate adjustments? Um, so, you know, here at Truebill, um, you know, we really started digging in that uh, as we were kind of really scaling our operations to get an understanding about, you know, how are customers actually coming in? What is it costing us to acquire them? How are they interacting? How long are they sticking around so that we can get a good prediction around, you know, what our revenue is going to build up like, um, start to understand key metrics and drivers of the business. So then we can help the rest of the organization align around what we need to change, what needs to be adjusted and, and where we're doing what well and, you know, where to kind of put our best foot forward moving uh, as we kind of move at scale. Um, so at a high level, that's kind of how I see fine, uh, the fp &A functions and uh, the value it provides to the larger organization. Okay, cool. Well, maybe maybe we can add something that like nowadays. Well, at least in the in the in the startup world, like uh, we can do like plans and forecast everything like long term, like three five years. But in reality, like in the startup world, everything changes in a sec. So right now we need to focus, uh, like put all our eyes on target when it comes to short term, no more than two three years, because. We, everything will change and we have to be ready in order to to be like prepare in order to hold these kind of changes so i mean for me like the main the main thing that makes important uh, the fna is that we need to be prepared for any type of contingency and and of course in order to do that you have to own your data and you have to be aware how far you can go how much you you, you can hold and basically is like your your strategy what it gives you the the main uh the main keys in order for you to be successful in in the future like for me is that we can we can target it in that way okay exactly picking up on javier uh, point of view startups by definition uh, by definition are young companies so getting data many times it's hard to to do so when we forecast in in a big in the long period of time uh, it's hard of course we'll do mistakes even if even for a short period of time but it's important for us to try to predict the best we can and build a flexible um, forecast in order for us to account for any shifts because while we are a small vessel it's easy any wave can shift us more to the right or to the left and we'll go. We'll have to go because we're not big enough to contradict the flow. Okay. None of you talked about uh, how to predict the cash flow and and the and the runway that we would have. I guess that in the last uh, six to twelve months, it will be a, a main topic to forecast the cash, to secure it, uh, just to go uh, through this uh, this crossing and to be a. Uh, to still have a, a, a enough money to just uh, survive during this uh, this period. Run rate is a very important KPI that we should keep track on uh, because it will tell you how many uh, how much money you have and for how long uh, do you have it. In startups, uh, usually profitability and uh, and cash and growth do not go hand by hand you have to opt either for profitability or either for growth. Usually what we want to do is to grow as, as much as we can. So for that, we need money. <laughs> That's why you should keep an eye, a very, very uh, big eye on that and update as much as we can with all the information that we can and involve uh, all the teams like the sales team, the engineering team, the product team, uh, so we can, we can understand where are we going and how much money do we need to achieve those objectives. Yeah, exactly. I will like uh, complementing a bit what Luis was saying. Like here, I think the main the main role for the director or the responsible, the finance department, because they they have to be the one who owns the data in order to to develop the strategies and the main like uh, actions that are going to be made in order to to grow the company. Is that we need to own each department uh, data, and for that 
like the best the best people to do that is each managers so for us we have to teach them like each manager how to use their data and how to own it we have to gain them like the comfort they have to be really comfortable managing what they have the resources the budget like how much they can spend how much they cannot and you because you'll be the owner you need to find the synergies that will have to go across to the the, the old team members and sometimes i'm seeing like the role of the finance director more than like a full counselor of the company because you need to be aware how does the sales team works how does the marketing why does the tech team is doing that and you need to find the best way in order to interpret it and to make your own assumptions about how the future will be look like on the this scene because at the end of the day you need to be the company in order to see where you're going where are your next steps so this is a really key like for me it's a really key element in order for you to get this to have this synergy uh, across the team members or the team managers of the company so you can drive the strategy has I, I know not just has the finance director because he's all, the guy who owns the data and he has to pull the results. It has to be like the whole team that is gathering, that it developed the strategies and is creating the synergies in order to drive the numbers like going forward, right? It's a perfect transition, Javier. Uh, you talked about owning the data, working with the other team to gather all the data, but uh, concretely, how do you how do you work with other team? How do you gather all the data from from the from the field, and and how do you validate it? All this input, as you said, you have to be in mind the how every team is working to just understand all this input. How do you do so in a monthly, quarterly, yearly basis? Yeah, I think like the main thing uh, when you develop everything is like have everything clear, like how everything will have to go in each department. Uh, you have to build like the at least the frame of the of uh, of each uh, budget of uh, each forecast for each uh, individual team, and then you have to learn. Uh, you have to teach each manager in order to how that works and how them. Uh, give them the importance that they have, of course, because they are important in, in, each, uh, in each area. And you have to teach them how to own it, how to manage it, how to interpret it, the numbers, and what actions they can do in order to help you to forecast their their, their future performance. If they are doing, if they are having savings, if they are not, if they, are, uh, uh, if they over exceed their, their expenses, for example. Like for me, like you have to have a really strong reporting and then you have to teach every manager in order to own the data, in order to encourage them to help you and to give you the best criteria in order to do the forecast in a in the long run in general. Okay, Rain, I know that you have a, a target of two percent accuracy in the next six months. How yeah. how do you do it? <laughs> yeah, so it, it, you don't do it overnight. That's for sure. So I think to Javier's point. One of the uh, biggest things you have to do is you make connections with people across the organization because finance definitely cannot do this in a vacuum. We can throw numbers on a wall, but you're not going to be accurate. So you have to start by starting to understand how each of those teams works. What are the main drivers of the business that they control? And then start to translate that back to something that they see on the day to day. So they can start to understand how that number relates to them on a day to day basis. Start setting targets there, understanding the implications for how that affects your forecast. And then you slowly over time start to get more and more refined about that process. And so you may start out with, you know, a really large kind of blunt object initially and like a number that's just kind of. Uh, you, you know, it's large, it's going to have wiggle room. You might be off any given month, maybe 10, 15, 20%. But over time, you'll find ways to be more and more accurate about predicting that number as you dig in with those teams. And so you just keep narrowing that down until you get to the point where you feel deadly accurate about being able to forecast, you know, out three months, six months, and then hopefully eventually a year, especially as your company starts to mature and gets closer to raising large rounds or potentially going public down the line. Um, but a lot of it is those relationships. So the tools are helpful, the processes are helpful, but the relationships are definitely critical to making sure you're accurate. Absolutely. Cool. Uh, and how did you 
when everything is together and when you have all the input from from the field, how did you validate? How did you challenge all these figures that is coming from from the field? I guess that the the relationship is not enough to validate the figure and to be sure that what you are gathering from the field uh, it's accurate and you can and you can you can use it for you for your forecast how did you for example use your uh, uh, historical data to ch to challenge and to validate the, all the assumption well actually like for me in, this, in, 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 in this in this point is is really important for you as uh, as we said it before to know how the company is working and what are the outside uh, like events that happen in that month. Like you just have to highlight the highlights of the month and say, okay, what was the performance of the team? Why does marketing did, did not spend the, the, that amount of money and we did some savings, but that will impact the, the top line, like the amount of leads that we're receiving. So you need to be aware like how everything works, like the flow of the company in order for you to validate that those assumptions or those results are like clear or is, is something going wrong? Maybe you can even find some errors when it comes to budgeting or when it comes to forecasting and all these kind of things. So based on this clear understanding about how the company behaves, is that you will be able to drive the, to adjust the forecast. And as Rain said, it's like, you need to be fully accurate in, and for that, you need to be like totally aware how everything works. And of course, in my case, I'm I'm a I'm a guy who's like I'm taking calculated risk. So I know that my gaps are can 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 be like like quite high or quite low. So I have to be I have to develop these strategies in order to hold like for example 20% down on sales forecast or what I'm gonna do if I have 20% off. Should I should I adjust the budget? Should I have to do some other things? Can I use that in order to boost the the sales team or hirings you know like for me is that that's that's the main thing that you need to be aware of when you're trying to validate the results crystal clear thanks Javier um Reigns, you talk about uh, the relationship and the tools and process that help you in gathering everything how how did you work? Which uh, which tool do you use? Which kind of process have you implemented to to uh, to work with your team uh, in order to uh, gather all the all the insight and the, all the input? Yeah, so th th this is my my opinion. So it'll be interesting to see what other people. But the quicker you can get off Excel, which I'm sure we we all live in a lot, but the quicker you can get off of that, the better. So I, I, we moved to adaptive insights and it's, you know, it, it's a great planning tool. We're still going through the finalization, the implementation, but it allows you to kind of pivot to kind of Javier's point as we alluded to before, you know, you, you can really quickly make adjustments on the fly. You don't have to worry about, oh, it lives, you know, the latest model lives in some obscure analyst computer somewhere. And if they're out, you don't have access to it. So things like that, where you can centralize, make it easy for people to adjust it really get rid of potentially that human error that happens with Excel files. Always great. So from an FPNA tool, a blunt tool, you know, that's, that's a great place um, to kind of eventually get to, um, you know, some of the stuff that we did on the team side, it's really about figuring out what drives the organization and starting to embed people there. So if your marketing is the driver of your organization or the sales team is the driver of your organization, getting someone to live and make that be their full life, you know, an analyst that says, hey, you work with the sales team 100 percent, no one else. All you do is understand everything that they do. That's going to be insanely valuable for you, especially if you're a high growth company, because they're going to live day to day just understanding what the salespeople do, how they view the world and how best to translate that back to your larger model so that that way you don't miss a beat. And then when sales says something, there's not some translation error and you hear, oh, you're going to hit this target. And what they're actually saying is, I ah, maybe if I win this one nice contract. So, you know, figuring out what drives the organization. And I think Javier said this, con concentrating on that. And, you know, some of the other areas, like, you know, when it comes to T&E, you know, travel and entertainment, you could be off 10, 15%. That's not going to kill you. But if you miss your revenue target by 10 or 15%, especially on the downside, people are not going to be happy. Cool. 
Uh, if I remember well, Javier and, and Luis, in your side, you are pretty in the old fashioned way, uh, into uh, some Excel and some Google <laughs> spreadsheets together, yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah, like ma mainly Excel is is most of everything. Um, well, right now I'm I'm started working with, with with Excel, but before yes, I was using lots of tools in order to control like expenses uh, to assign a budget for each team, and this this gave you the the comfort of every day, not looking the the bank account and say like what what happened, you know. So a really good tools in order to do that is like um, you need to give the each manager their own their own tool that is being really controlled and like of course when the company is growing you need to sign a special controller in order to be the owner of the that area like the sales team he has to control like everything that is happening with the with, with the sales team like the drivers the input that the that the tools are giving them matching the numbers because of course we will need to like link and to merge lots of uh tools or data analysis uh, uh, tools in general. So they need to validate that everything is working in place and give you the key insights because at the end of the day, if your company is growing, it's skyrocketing and you're going to start having like more than 100 people in each team, it's it's going to be like an impossible work. So that's, that, that's for me, I think what Ray said, assigning someone who lived in that area who will be your right hand in order to express you what 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 is happening there is one of the key things and of course tools will help you to to like uh diminish the the human error that or beautiful excel sheets always will do and so yeah try to automatize everything as possible like sooner is better And what about you, uh, Luis? How do you how do you work with we, this? We well, Excel uh, has human error, error. I agree, but it's the common denominator denominator that we we can find across the company. Mm -hmm. This is why this is a, a powerful tool for us. Still, we haven't found yet one uh, that fully adapts to our reality because each company is different. But each department works with their own. And then when we need reporting, Excel will be the, always the, the source for it. Okay, thanks. We had a lot of questions in the Q&A session about the tool, so thanks a lot for your insight. Uh, I guess that it's time for us to switch into the Q&A session. Uh, we had a lot, uh, and we are going to start with uh, Jan. Jan is asking to you, Rain. Uh, you talked about connection across the, the organization. Uh, have you done anything unique to build that connection? Yeah, um, so one of the, and I think the best example we did, um, we're building a lot of new products as we kind of build out the true build product offering to consumers. And so one of the things I went ahead and got was a, a decision support analyst to live side by side with the product managers. And and in a perfect world, I'd have, you know, almost one for each product manager, right? But accounting and finance, you know, we were always the last ones to get funding. So I, I have one and he is embedded with each one of the product managers and just, you know, helps them to understand how they're thinking about a product. Is that meaningfully helping us as a company achieve some of our goals, whether that's, you know, engagement, ASP improvement, churn reduction, whatever it might be, and then helps them to kind of model that out and think about it from a business side. And that's been insanely valuable because it has caused some of those product people to, you know, stop and think for a second, this is a cool product. Does it help us accomplish our mission? Does it help us accomplish where we want to go as an organization? Um, and so kind of what we were all just talking about, as you start to get those people and they start to live with the, the biggest movers and shakers in your organization, um, you'll really start to get that value add both from your end, having visibility into what they're doing, but also on their end, they'll start to understand, you know, better what their goals are and what they need to accomplish. Um, and you'll have someone living side by side with them to kind of say, yeah, you're on track or, you know, no, we might need to rethink how we're uh, targeting this product and what it should actually accomplish for us. So for me, that's been the place right now at Truebill that has been a huge value add as a decision support analyst. Cool. Thanks, uh, Rain. Um, another question for you, Rain, about uh, Adaptive Insight, the question from uh, Martin. Uh, is Adaptive Insight affordable for startups? 
Christian? I, I guess it depends on where you are. Um, I would say typically adaptive implementation can be 20 to 40,000 if you hire someone. And then on an annual basis, it can be anywhere from like 20 to 50 K. So uh, that's generally with the price range I've seen. And I think even for things like planful, which used to be host analytics, it's similar. Um, so they, they are a bit pricey, but you know, if it can make you a little bit more accurate and help you to fundraise, you know, sometimes that can be worth it. So maybe not for the seed round, but if you're doing a series A, series B, that's the ideal place to get it. And you may have to fight a little bit for it, but um, it, it's nice to have, that's for sure. Cool, thanks. Um, a question from Theophil. Um, what is the planning cycle at your respective uh, company? How many forecast uh, estimates uh, latest estimate and when, how does the planning process uh, last? So I guess in the last uh, few months, it was uh, mainly a monthly basis uh, for every every government announcement. Uh, we, we, we had to, uh, to reforecast. Yeah, well, actually, like when uh, before COVID, everything was kind of like in a quarterly basis or something like that. But after COVID, it was like highly intensive monthly basis reporting. Like we just review numbers like at least twice a month in order to develop the strategies. Like because on the COVID, everything was developed contingency plans. So we will need to be fully about, uh, aware about where is your cash going? How we can leverage that? How, which type of savings can we do? And this, this good practices for me, in my case, for example, because I started when, when COVID strike and we, we had like everything planned to go to Series A, for example. So the cash was kind of tight. So we, 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 we needed to do something in this case. So we need to do like lots of uh, contingency plans, see the financing way that we can do in order to extend or to be cautious about what happened in Series A doesn't come or we will have to delay it or not. So, and this and, and these good 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 habits, if if, if you could say like that, it, they are good. And this is something that we have owned, like uh, by myself, at least. I have I, I do it like a, every single month because you are, when you do this in in a, in a monthly basis, as Rain said, you need to be accurate when it comes to forecasting. Like the last the last months that we were that we were doing the forecast. We were like stri striking the end, uh, the bank, the ending bank balance, for example. We we're like striking it. It was really cool. It's because of these practices, you know. So, more you are uh, into your data, you will be able to easily drive the numbers in the way that you want, at least in the very short term, like for one to three months. And if you do it accurately and you have like the best reliable data quality and the best reliable like forecast you will be able to hit targets within one or two years even i think is that that for me would be the, the, the best uh, cool thanks javier um we have another question from leila uh, in a small company how to in introduce cost budget culture to accomplish a better pna that's a good question, actually, <laughs> because usually in smaller companies, uh, managers are not used to these uh, these concepts of budget, uh, cost control, achieving a uh, sales target. So it's really important to bring them on board. And as Javier mentioned before, explain them, bringing them to the overall uh, view uh, of the company to in order to make them be a part of the process and make them responsible and feel responsible for it yeah exactly like you have to entitle them in order to explain why your role is so important for the company even though it's like launching a camp marketing campaign you need to explain them how that will influence the top line and how that that lead will go through onto your bottom line so that's how people will say like oh okay i'm not just launching a marketing campaign or I'm not just minimizing cost on the infrastructure. It's like, it has a really big impact on the company. And even better, we are startups. So we're always aiming to get more funding, more series, series A, series B, and 
get um, for the growth. So you have to give them like this perspective of the future. So if you do a good work, we're going to be someone there in the future. <laughs> so that's how people will be like more into the feel more like they're part of the company, not like the department specifically. Yeah, if, if, if I can add something uh, about that, I, I, I would say that the transparency is also a key. Uh, at, at Spendes, we, lot, we share a lot of reports to all the cross-functional leaders, and all this report is based on the cost, based on the budget. And when we started to share all these figures, share all this uh, reporting uh, by team, uh, all the, uh, the sales efficiency, etc., we... We empower all every every team to uh, the financial culture and to let them be an, an, an owner of their uh, their costs and KPIs. So I, I, I think and it, it, it is the first time I, I, I see this kind of transparency at uh, at Spendet. I think the um, sharing a lot of reports, a lot of data with your team could also help to uh, to have a better uh, cost and budget culture for your for your team. Um, another question from Alice. Um, in such a frequent, a frequently changing business environment, do you recommend uh, comparing to an original annual budget or to involving monthly, quarterly reforecast or looking both? I guess Javier, you already uh, answered the question by your <laughs> well, monthly. Uh, I, 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 actually, this is kind of fun because sometimes, well, it, it, it put in the example of COVID, right? So we start the year with a with a really ambitious budget, but COVID strikes, so we had to adapt, we had to change, we had to develop like a contingency plans. So we have to do like tons of things in order to do savings and in order to just optimize our resources in order to get the best uh, top line. So at the end, when we were doing all reportings, we're like, okay, versus 2022 20, uh, versus budget, everything was so spectacular because we were like doing massive savings. But on the other hand, like the, the top line, it was like decreasing by, by 30% or something like that. And the, the, it was something that you need to be fully aware when you're presented to your investors, for example, because you can mislead the, the message that you're trying to send. So maybe when there is like really big changes on your on your forecast, for example, your budget for 2021 for, was for 10 million. And for some reason, you're going to hit five. You have to re, re budget everything and say like, hey, extraordinary meeting, board meeting. We say like, we're not going to accomplish this. This is our new new budget. Or on the other hand, if we are hitting like more than 10, like 15, we're going to say like, yes. Right now, we're going to over exceed by 50% of budget. So we're going to keep that as a reminder that we can perform better. But with this is the new uh, adjusted budget. Because at the end of the day, if you are showing and you're comparing apples with oranges, it's not that good in order to show a good picture of the management of the company. So you need to be really realistic when you are having like massive changes. Of course, not like minimum changes, but like massive changes. It needs to be like fully disclosed. In general, like from my own perspective. In Swog, uh, rule of thumb for budgeting is every time that you we have from budget a deviation uh, over twenty five percent, we revisit the budget and re, we redo it uh, for uh, for the number of months that we have until the end of the year. So the budget is there because it's the the benchmark that we set for the year. But every time that we see uh, or a potential deviation, big deviation, we have redo it uh, again and then we monthly uh, update our forecast with any changes for instance if i know that in december i'll have something uh, a new customer a big customer or a customer will churn i'll uh, already adjust the forecast for december we always do it for 12 months uh, rolling the following 12 months the forecast yeah i, I will uh, we, we do the rolling we do rolling 18 month and it's we try to do quarterly a lot of like the OPEX and stuff, you know, like the headcounts for the back office departments, just so that way we're not necessarily bogging them down on a monthly basis, unless some major impact happens. But then like revenue, anything that affects that top line, you know, the cost of goods, stuff that's really a big mover that we're doing monthly and sometimes even enter month if we find out things are, you know, really shaking up differently just to understand like, OK, you know, 
to the points that um, uh, Louis and uh, Javier made, like if you see anything big happening, you have to make adjustment. You can't wait till the next forecasting period comes around. You got to do it. And then the, the one other thing I, I would say is that I always keep a target for like the sales and marketing team. And that's normally a little bit higher. And then there's like the one you show to the board, which I don't change unless I feel really, really confident that I'm actually now going to beat and kind of I can do a beat and raise. But the sales marketing team, I always kind of like, well, this is where we should be. And if you come in below this, I'd be disappointed and try to just get them to keep pushing those juices a little bit further so we can uh, squeeze a little bit more sales out of them. Well, actually, this this kind of practices, I think they are really, really common, like uh, between all the companies. You always said like the targets a little bit higher than your budget in order for them to just be driven in order to get the results. So you, at the end of the day, will be a picture of the company instead. But yes, it's it's a good practice, I think. It keeps people motivated and driven. Which which rate do you use, Javier? Uh, 20, 15%? Higher. Uh, well, it, it, it depends. In the, in the pen, it depends on the on, on the company. Like uh, before, we used to use twenty uh, percent. Yeah, okay. about the target. Yeah. Okay. Depends on how much BS the sales team gives you. Well, that too. Yeah, and you have to be aware of uh, like lots of factors. But yes, it has to be something reasonable in general. Um, we had a more technical question from uh, Malika. Uh, how did you approach establishing your CAC metrics and what who, what will go into the, the metrics? And I, I will add, do you reach to forecast your CAC in terms of budget, in terms of uh, rolling rate forecast? I know that the CAC computation is pretty complicated. Do, do you reach also to reach to uh, forecast these metrics also? Well, I think in, in, in my case, it's not that complicated when you are having like uh, kind of fixed costs in general and your team is really full aware of this. It's like, hey, you have the budget in order to accomplish this, uh, this sale or this new supplier and all these kind of things. So you'll be able to adjust it in order to hit the target. But when it comes to getting uh, other factors such as headcount, like... Mm -hmm. We can have like a, I don't know a high turnover on headcount. Therefore, your CAC will be lower, which is cool. But you're not having enough headcount in order to get like, to hit the the bottom line. So sometimes, depending on the on the structure of what are you including in your CAC, it's really important. For me, my own experience, if you take out the headcount and you just include the direct costs of uh, like really highly direct costs of the customer acquisition, it's better to hit it. And do you do you do any adjustment uh, about your uh, your acquisition cost? For example, at Spendesk, we um, create the headcount uh, based on their uh, ramp up curve. We have a lot of higher, so we create the salary uh, for the first four months to uh, based on the ramp up curve of the sales team, and we use this uh, salary prorated as the acquisition cost, which is much more relevant to have. A salary, including a wrap-up curve, based on the new customer, including a wrap-up curve. Do you do this kind of adjustment in the way that we, uh, uh, you are computing your CAC? Uh, well, yes, we always uh, considered like uh, ramp-up periods, always, okay. and we have like this margin of like uh, potential salary increases and bonuses, of course. So we we have like these gaps in order to move, but we can play. We always play with uh, with the ramp-up period. If we can include it or not, at the end of the day, you can you can customize it the way that you want, and you can even drive the numbers like hit the target. But the way the best way uh, in order to get like the most efficient, like the most reliable CAC, is to take out the the factors that are more variable or volatile. So you can add it like in on another line, for example. Like for me, it's, I think it's better. I like, try to keep it simple and keep it consistent when it comes to direct costs. Okay, cool. Um, we have a few questions. I have, I have a question from, uh, I don't find who, uh, which ask me, ask, asking me to uh, uh, ask a question which is upvoted, but I guess we already uh, uh, tackle a lot of them. Uh, we have a, a question from Julia. Are you using Excel, Google Sheet for SPNA analysis uh, or, or a tool 
So uh, Rain uh, told us that he's using Adaptive Inside, and Luis uh, Javier who is still in, into uh, uh, Google spreadsheet and and Excel. Uh, we have maybe a question from Martin that we can tackle. Uh, how do you connect budgeting and forecasting together in practice? Do you upkeep them separately, or do you have it connected? Uh, same with the PNL uh, and for the budgeting. And forecasting, do you do it completely separately or see if we directly from the PNM? Uh, okay, well, uh, I usually base my, my the, the, the assumptions that I do when I'm building or when I'm doing the, the forecasting is well, not that much conventional, but I'm like a, a cash driven, so I always start by cash flow. I always start by cash flow and I try to match everything with the PNL. So I, I always start the analysis and see if everything is, 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 is shown correctly in the PNL. So based on that, we do the, the, the forecast and we match the, the PNL. Because sometimes it's the, the cash at the end of the day is the thing that you can control the most, not that much the, the, the PNL when it comes to the, to the final results, because we have like lots of variables on BNL that you may not be able for, uh, to like forecast like accurate, but for me, like I'm I'm a cash driven guy, so I, I control cash, and based on that, I pass all the data to to the analysis to do ma the matching with the PNL, and that's 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 how I do like cash forecast and redo everything after that. We uh, we talked about it also, Rain, uh, before this uh, this session. You are also building first your PNL and then try to restate everything to uh, to, to to reach your cash position and your cash flow based on everything that you are going to pay quarterly, uh, uh, yearly, etc. Yeah, yeah, that's um that's how we go about it, and uh, and a lot of it would be you know we still care about cash. We, we do the PL first, and then if we see something in the cash we don't like, then that's when we have a conversation around, okay, do we need to put certain expenses on cards? Do we need to go back to vendors and negotiate terms? Um, is there anything with some of these larger contracts where we can switch from an annual payment to you know quarterly or monthly or whatever it might be? But uh, for us, we start from the, the, the P&L, and then we kind of go from there. And some of our biggest impacts are really around like revenue and things like AR and bad debt and stuff. So we have models and details about understanding how are those things shaping up to be able to understand collections and understand how much cash will actually be coming in the door because that's the one that's harder for us to control so to say because it all depends on you know since we're working with individual customers um their ability to pay and there's economic forces at play there that could have an impact um so that's the one that we have to model out understand a lot better to make sure that uh you know, nothing surprises us at the end of the month. So we have monitoring almost daily to say like, okay, do collections break anywhere along the way to make sure we're on our target? But we start ours from the P&L, make some assumptions on collection rates, make some assumptions on when things will be paid. And then that flows into our cash flow statement. So you could do it both ways. And I think if cash is, is really critical to you at the moment, you know, then you, then you may start from the cash flow statement first. We, we happen to be in a nice situation from that standpoint. So P&L first for us, revenue targets. Well, I, I think it's, it's, it, it depends on the stage of the company. Maybe Luis, it will, be, it, it will agree with me, but in, in companies that the startups who are really young, that's the, the main target, at least for the first two, three years. And then you have to change the model. I totally, I totally agree with, with Rain in this. Yeah. Got to keep the lights on. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah, cool. Uh, another question from François. Uh, can you talk to what KPIs you use, what system stack, and what issue you have? Maybe we already talked about the stack and the, and the main issue. Maybe you can focus on KPIs. What, 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 which KPIs do you do you track in your uh, in your company? Uh, is that uh, more marketing KPIs, uh, win rate, uh, number of leads, etc. In, uh, with a, a, higher, a higher point of view is uh, only CAC uh, in the global in the, in the global uh, in the global view 
Well, I think for me, uh, even though right now in, in Adukio is not like a fully uh, monthly re recurring revenue, we're still using the MRR in a, well, also in my previous company we, because we just a base subscription model. We always use the, the MRR because for me, it's the best indicator in order to measure the performance of the company. So you can easily, if you build like the storytelling like really properly, you can see how the trend will go and in order for you to optimize the value of the company, for example, or if you will need like some requirements of, of uh, financing in a long or short term based on, on that. Because at the end, like the MRR, it will be the best proxy for you to start going down into the, the, the forecast. And of course, like based on that, you will have to measure your, your profit margins, the CAC, and all the all the, the the performance indicators that are more like sensitive for your business. So it's like kind of ad hoc in general. But for me, like the top line, it has to be the the, the one who's who's the master on this. What about you, uh, Ren and Luis? Uh, well, MRR definitely is uh, one of the most important. Then we'll have some specifics for each of our companies for sure. Uh, but customer life cycle also is important for us and also churn, both gross, uh, gross, net, gross churn rate and net churn rate in order for us to understand if we are losing customers or not, but also if the new, new business is covering for the loss of the customers that are churning, for instance. Yeah, and in our, ours, we definitely do the, you know, the MRR, ARR, and then LTV to CAC is our other one. Um, especially because we're in such a high growth and there's so much baked into that, right? LTV encompasses the churn, it, it encompasses a conversion, it comes, you know, engagement, hopefully is a leading indicator. So there's a lot baked into that. So we, we look at those two as kind of our North star, so to say, and then, you know, you get that KPI tree from there. Cool. Last question. Uh, I think it will uh, summarize everything we, uh, we said uh, from the CFO Connect, uh, from Sophie uh, through the CFO Connect. What are the main components for a performant FPNS stack for you guys? So I'll, I'll say that uh, the, the most underrated thing is accounting. And for FPNA, if accounting has their stuff together, then when they give it to FPNA, it should be together. So before I even do something like adaptive or anything, I would say, what does accounting need to have? And like, let's get them. So like we upgraded them to NetSuite and we got them on Flowcast to help with the closed management. And we got them um, different systems just to kind of help them keep track of everything. So that way, once they pass everything off to FPNA, it's already like cleaned up and that that helps significantly even before we got into adaptive. And then once you get into adaptive, then it's like, okay, now you're streamlining your forecasting. You still have Excel, don't get me wrong. You never are gonna get rid of Excel and Google Sheets. They're always gonna be there in some capacity. Um, but start with accounting. The They're the gatekeepers of the data and they get it right, then it makes your job easier. I think it's also depend on, your, uh, on the stage, uh, Rain, uh, at Pendes, we also have the accounting internally, but at the very beginning, you always start by external accountant and the way that we, you are running your FPNS stack will be different if uh, the accounting is, uh, is, exter is externalized. Um, what about you, um, Javier, if you, uh, if you yeah. summarize the main, main component for a performant uh, FPNS stack at your stage? Yes, actually, I do agree. I totally agree with Ray. Because at the end of the day, if your numbers are not reliable, if you are if you are showing your investors something else that is not like fully the reality of the company, it like it's not only you are misunderstanding the numbers and make it, maybe you are doing like bad uh, assumptions of the growth of the company, but also it's like a bad image for, for the company itself. So that's why I was saying like you need uh, like because I'm a uh, cash oriented like in the short term like cash for me is king. I need to double check everything that goes from accounting. And the base thing that right now, because we had it, uh, well, it's kind of uh, um, a mix. It's internalized it, but also it at the same time when it comes to taxes and everything. So what I do is like try to get the all the data the most reliable as possible. Everything has to be clean. Like all the information, if you are working with external uh, accountants, 
you have to give them like everything like this. So it just they have to just do their, their accounting stuff and they put up like a really high quality report. But if you don't pay that much attention, that is the, the is really good practice for really young startups that you just send all the information to the accountants and they say like, yeah, they're gonna handle it. But at the end of the day, if you take a look on the on the books, on the general ledgers and everything, you'll, you'll find like a whole mess and it's not gonna be good for you or the company. So it's like, try to organize all your information and send all the, uh, the clearest information as possible to your ex accountants or external accountants in order to proceed to process your, 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 your books, basically. So that's for me is the, the main thing. And of course, in my case, because I, I have like lots of cash movements, I have a team specialized in accounts receivable, accounts payable, so they have to be on that all the time. So what, what Rain was saying, like we need to be aware why we're not collecting that much in, in that month or where we are paying, if we're paying good, if we're paying bad, we need to like reduce the human error in these kind of things. So a, a cost uh, tool that will help you to control everything, all your expenses is really useful and a system that will control and manage and predict the behavior of your collections accounts receivable it's beautiful. So when you have like those three things in, in like in harmony, everything will be like beautiful in theory, <laughs> in theory. Cool. Thanks a lot. Uh, cautious of time. Uh, we can't unfortunately tackle all the uh, question. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for attending this session. Thanks a lot, Luis, Javier, Rain. Very, very insightful. Um, if you want to deep dive, uh, on uh, forecasting and planning, you can uh, join us into the table uh, forecast and planning just uh, just after. Uh, Rain, uh, Javier, and I uh, will be available uh, with a small group in this uh, table. If you uh, if you want to uh, to jump and to have a, a closer di discussion with uh, with us, thanks a lot uh, again uh, and enjoy the rest of the the summit.